And it's Welcome to Mistara. I'm Mr. Welch, and today we are talking about a book that a lot of people have asked me to do, which is the Rule Cyclopedia from 1991, Aaron Alston. This was a compilation of the basic expert companion and master sets. It included a bit of the immortal set, but not enough to really count. It cleaned up a lot of the rules. It included quite a few of the rules from the Gazetteer series. It uh, dropped a few things that weren't really considered that important, like, for example, the rules on jousting. It added some new material, for example, the Mystic, which was Mistara's version of the Monk, got added. And they also included things like the Druid, which was a Cleric variant, and a few other things. For the longest, it was considered one of the holy grails of collecting because it wasn't very common, though it's a beefy book and it's well put together, so they weren't... It wasn't that there was a limited number of them or that they were disappearing, it's just that they were a really well-built book and everybody collected them, so they were being held on to in treasure hordes and guarded more fiercely than any dragon. And just to make you weep for the old days and those prices from the early 90s, this book contained everything you needed to play a campaign. It had all the rules compiled into one, and the cost of the book was only $25. The tragedy of the Rules Cyclopedia was this came in 1991 at the very tail end of Back May. They quickly discontinued it right after this book came out, and they switched to uh, second edition in 92. Mastaro would linger on releasing a few products a year up until 95, and then the entire line would finally be dropped. This was during the tailspin of TSR, and the company itself did not survive much longer after that. So in many regards, this book is the ultimate source book for the Mistara world. The actual Mistara content inside was pretty limited. It gave just a brief overview of everything that was put out in the Gaze of Tears. But the rules that were included were definitively Mistaran because it had everything that Mistara was about. It had the rules for the mass combat, the paths to immortality, domain management. You could make magic items. Just everything you needed to, to run a Gaze of Tears in a Mistara setting this book has it. There's a lot of differences between Dungeons & Dragons and Advanced Dungeons & Dragons at this time. The most important one, of course, was that your race was your class. Only humans could be the different classes that we recognize for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. So if you wanted to be a fighter, a cleric, a thief, or a magic user, you had to be a human. If you were an elf, you were a fighter magic user. If you were a dwarf, you were a fighter with tougher uh, abilities. And if you were a halfling, you were a stealth-based fighter. If you wanted to play a halfling uh, thief, well, that didn't exactly happen. But you could kind of cheat it with the excellent skill system. Alignments were more along the Michael Moorcock uh, lawful versus chaos axis. There was no good, there was no evil, it was lawful, neutral, and chaotic. Though lawful was generally assumed to be good, and chaotic was generally assumed to be evil. But that was not always the case, because like the Jin, I think, were chaotic, but they were good aligned. They just didn't like to be uh, stifled with rules. The other big change was the number of levels that were involved in the Rule Cyclopedia went up to 36 for humans, and then it went up slightly different for uh, demi-human races. Clerics and wizards would get massive amounts of spells at high level. Thieves would master their large number of skills, and fighters, as they progressed, would unlock uh, more and more attacks and more and more special attacks. The big thing for the fighters was weapon mastery, which go into a lot more detail later. When everybody hit ninth level, then you started to get, attract followers that wanted to, you know, have you tutor them, and then you could start acquiring land, and that's when the domain management kicks in. The Rule Cyclopedia and Beckman in general did not do the murder hobo thing. They assumed that after a while you would get tired of crawling around in dungeons, pecking and searching for gold pieces, and would want to settle down, raise a family, join the PTA, buy some sensible shoes on a Chevrolet, then party till you're broke and they drag you away. But that's okay, because you can still play D&D. Fighters would be given a castle to guard. Magic users would build their tower to do their research. Clerics would be given a temple. Thieves would start their own guild or be given a guild if they were in good terms with the guild they started with, just in a different city. Then the game would take more of a political bent, which the party would occasionally get together to take care of large and massive uh, threats to their kingdoms, but they would still be running their own. Little plots of land, and you could run them as any way you want to, though the more radical you tried to make it, the good chance that it was going to fail because, well, it, people like stability. 
So they gave us a domain system which took into account just about everything. Natural disasters, invasions, spies, everything. The better you ran your kingdom, the easier it got. As the better a kingdom was run, the easier it became to run it because it started to become self-sustaining. And if you started really doing badly with the domain, it could usually spiral out of control and then you end up with a revolt or just being overthrown. Now, if you wanted to try diplomacy through uh, other means, it had a large large and expansive set of rules for uh, mass combat, which were pretty setting generic. You can take those straight out, written word for word, put them in 5th edition, and no one will notice the difference. The War Machine rule set took into account troop quality, the weapons you were using, the type of monsters you had, your leadership abilities, and just about everything else you could need to run a uh, mass combat system. And then the actual mechanics of it were extremely simple. Well, I wouldn't say simple. They were streamlined. You'd find a territory to fight over. You would pick your strategy. They would pick their strategy. Apply all modifiers. Roll a D100. Apply the uh, results on the chart, and that tells you who won and how badly. Then it takes into account morale, losses. If you want to let the uh, enemy recoup his losses, if you want to feel merciful, that's all included. Like I said, even if you do not play uh, the rule cyclopedia, grab this just for the, the mass combat section, because if you play 5th edition, that's one thing they do not cover at all. A lot of people call this the basic set, and yes, it's simpler from 1st uh, and 2nd edition Dungeons & Dragons in many aspects, but it's also a lot more complex in several other aspects. For example, Weapon Mastery is the most comprehensive and complex uh, system of weapon skills in any D&D set, and it's the best written and makes fighters something more than just guys with swords at high levels because as you level up with the weapon mastery system your sword or your weapon of choice gets better so a sword starts off at d8 but when you get to a grandmaster with the proficiencies you can actually throw it not very well it does 2d6 plus 8 damage it actually gives you a massive bonus to your armor class there's multiple ways you can attack with it and you can use it to attack, to deflect, or disarm your opponent. And there's a chart for every single weapon in the game, so everything goes from just piddly damage all the way up to large amounts of damage, so when you're facing the dragons, hitting it for just a little micro cosm of damage while the thief backstabs it for massive damage while the wizard blows chunks out of it with spells you can actually still do stuff granted the chart is extremely scary looking because it's got a lot of you know little symbols and uh, codes that you have to constantly look up but once you get the hang of it it's not too hard yes it makes the game much more complex but at the higher level stuff that's what you need because you just can't keep adding extra hit points and a lower thaco and with only three attacks with a sword you're only going to be doing small amounts of damage to the big nasty stuff at the very end when you hit uh, companion or master level. And speaking of the high level, the demi-humans only go up so far. The halflings only can make it to level 8. The elves make it to, I think, level 10, and dwarves get to level 12 before they stop leveling up as normal. Then they have attack ranks. Attack ranks are like pseudo levels. You don't get hit points, but you do get abilities, and your ability to attack go gets better when you get to those uh, ranks. Dwarves will continue to get extra attacks as they level up, so will, well, so will the Elf and the Halfling. And then you'll get racial abilities, because the Dwarves get something which is similar to evasion against all magic damage. And if they make a saving throw, they take quarter damage. Halflings get harder and harder to hit. Of course, the Elves get spells, but they only go up to level 5 spells, and they never really get any better than that as far as magic using. But since the Elf, the Dwarf, and the Halfling are all basically fighter types, they do get access to the different combat maneuvers that are exclusive to the fighter. There's a few that they don't get based on the size, but those are few and far between. It basically boils down to you declare a specific type of attack, you roll to hit, if you connect, then you get bonuses to the damage or something bad happens to, your, to the other guy. And the rule cyclopedia is scaled down rules-wise from a lot of the options that the first and second edition D&D uh, &D has. There's not as many weapons, there's not as much gear, there's not as many spells. There's no multi-classing, there's no dual classing. You do get more options uh, on the classes you have. For example, in 1st uh, and 2nd edition, a fighter would just go on being a fighter forever and not really do anything other more than swing a sword. In the rule cyclopedia, you get things to do with the sword, and you also get uh, your castles and stuff like that. 
it is very much a trade-off. It depends on what kind of system you want to run. Do you want to just go do dungeon crawling forever and always? Then you go first and second edition D&D. If you actually want to get your character into politics and get better as far as what you're doing in the world, then you want to do the rule cyclopedia. If you don't think there's enough math in the game, go play third and 3.5. If you just want to play a board game and you know occasionally talk to people, that's fourth edition for you. And if you all want to be superheroes and get some sort of special bonus every single level, than only playing the Forgotten Realms, then you want to go play 5th edition. Another thing that the Rules Cyclopedia got right more than any other setting, at least in my opinion, which is should be stated fact because, well, that's why you're listening to me, right? The rules for skill proficiencies are still superior to that of any other rule set in D&D because it's open-ended. It's not super restrictive like it was in other sets. No skill is only attached to certain classes. If a fighter wants to learn how to make snares, he can. If your wizard, for some reason, wants to be able to pick up heavy rocks and move them as a skill, knock yourself out. I've always hated cross-class skills. I just That always stuck me the wrong way ever since I read it in 3.0 because you're restricting people's imaginations. 5th edition has the problem with there's only, what, 18 skills, and if you don't pick up those skills at character creation, you never get any new skills. Except for taking a feat, which is generally considered useless, or using the manipulation for the cross-class system to get access to the very few uh, classes and archetypes that give you extra skills later. So once you have your skill set, that's it. You're stuck with it forever and always. So the Rule Cyclopedia took all of the different uh, proficiency skill rules from all the Gazetteers, and they were all over the place, and condensed them, combined them, and merged them into one cohesive set. Yes, there's a lot of skills. You could probably shave off about a third of them and nobody would notice. When you start the game, you get four skills. You also get a bonus skill for every plus of your intelligence bonus. So wizards usually get more skills, but if you happen to be a fighter like Gandalf and have an 18 intelligence, you also can take the three extra skills. Proficiency checks, you roll under the level. So if you were to take hunting, which is an intelligence skill, and you have an intelligence of 13, you'd have to roll a 13 or under to pass the skill check. But every class is every skill available to them. So if you wanted to play a war wizard, you can do it. You can take skills in artillery or military tactics. That's completely acceptable. If you want your fighter to be a more ranger type, if you wanted to turn your fighter into a ranger type, because, well, they didn't have rangers in this book, then you, you spend your four skill points on hunting and tracking and snares and survival or any of the other outdoorsy stuff. Every three levels, you get a skill point to buy a new skill or put plus one into a skill you already have. It's a pretty simple system. The beauty is the fact that it's so open-ended. And if you were a demi-human and you wanted to play a thief type, you can take a few skills to mimic the thief abilities like stealth or profession lockpick or things like that. If you want, and I do suggest it, give people starting skills based on what they are like dwarves get caving, which is surviving in caves. You can give halfling skills in farming, elves skills in doing stuff in the forest and so on. So if you're playing in Mastara, try to find a skill that's associated with different kingdoms, like the Ethengar can get horse riding, or the Derekin can get bargaining, and give, start them out with that so everybody gets a little bit extra to start the game. If you're a dungeon master and you want to play the B, E, C, or M modules, this book has everything you need to run it. It includes all the treasures, all the monsters, everything. You don't have to bring all four of the different box sets. Everything has been included in this game. Now you're going to have to update some of the modules because these add a few more rules which are not available, like for example obviously the skill systems, but those add so much to the game that you're going to want to include them. It has all the monsters from all the expansions. It's really art light in the monster section, so you're just going to have to use your imagination when it describes stuff. There's a few monsters that are in the rule cyclopedia that appeared nowhere else. I think the Ragadigio, which is a type of giant spider, which gave me nightmares the first time I ran into it. Also, probably the 20th time I ran into it, my dungeon master, when I first got started, really was good in describing spiders. I think that was a fetish of his. It's completely compatible with the creature catalogs, both the green and the orange, so you can just plug those right in. The list of magic items is impressive and complex, and it includes some of the best uh, magic item creation, at least as far as weapons go, that you're going to find in Dungeons & Dragons. They did kind of crib that for 3rd edition, which is fair enough, because it was an excellent system and other people should share it. Even people that liked the power build and the number crunch of 3rd, it gives you this massive list of what to spend gold on, so if you 
want to build a giant castle, knock yourself out. And if you're running around in the later stages and you're running through these modules that just give you millions of gold and all that sort of stuff, you can rebuild whatever you want. If you want to take your millions of gold that you got from Saber River and, you know, recreate Fantasy Vegas, knock yourself out. In fact, invite. In the back of the book, there's a brief summary and maps of all of the Mistara nations. It really doesn't go into detail. You're going to need the Gaze of Tears to, to fully expand on it. So the link to Mistara is pretty tenuous, except for the last few dozen pages. And even then, you're going to want the Gaze of Tear maps because they're so much more expansive than these compressed little bitty things that are kind of like pale comparisons to the originals. There's a little bit of stuff taken from the Immortals book, which they included in here, like the different kind of planes. But for the most part, most of the Immortal stuff got uh, subsumed into Wrath of the Immortals. Now, this is the part where I tell you how much it's going to cost. If you want to get an original print one, it's going to cost you about $900. They're, uh, they're pretty hard to come by. That's over on eBay or Amazon. But you don't have to do that because Drive -Thru RPG just reprinted them in both softback and hardback. The softback's actually $25. It's the same price as the original. The hardback's only $30, and of course, they'll mail it to you. So go over there, get yourself a copy of the book right now. There was some initial printing issues. I've been told that that's been solved or at least been uh, fixed. I have an original copy, but my friends that have bought the reprints have said that the, the manufacturer is fantastic. There was just a little issue with blurring while they were trying to get the initial kinks out of the uh, printing process at the very start. So that's going to wrap up the rules cyclopedia. It's a rule set. It's a game unto itself. If you're playing in the Mistara and you want to play with the old rules, it's mandatory. It's the rules. You have to have it. You can start this for $25. If you want to play 5th edition, you can get all three books over there for $150. It's your choice. So going on for next week, I'm going to kill off the X series that I've been working on because there's only two modules I haven't covered. So we'll start the next one with X11, Saga of the Shadow Lords. We are going off the map to the nation of Windar to stop an ancient evil. So until next time, man, I picked a bad day to stop smoking crack.